It's quarter to 12, Nigeria. We either get it right or we fall off the brink. Hello, I'm Kadria Ahmed. Welcome to another edition of Quarter to 12, where accomplished Nigerians speak on their life, work, and the lived Nigeria experience. This is a Radio Now production. Clad in a blue-gray hijab, her clenched fist raised high above her head in a clear expression of defiance and protest, Aisha Yusufu quickly became one of the people who personified the NSAS protests in Nigeria back in 2020. That picture of her quickly became iconic and continues to symbolize the strength and resilience of those who stood up to police tyranny in Nigeria. But Aisha Yusufu's activism did not start with the NSAS protests. She has been a consistent and vocal advocate for the return of hundreds of girls and boys abducted by the terrorist group Boko Haram, starting with the Bring Back Our Girls movement, following the abduction of hundreds of girls from a secondary school in Chibok in northeast Nigeria. She's also a harsh critic of government failures and frequently demands accountability from political office holders. On this episode of Quarter to Twelve, I am pleased to be speaking to Aisha Yusufu on her activism, her faith, her take on Nigeria as we head to the polls for another national election, and her plans for the future. Welcome to Quarter to Twelve, Aisha. Thank you Thanks. so much for saying yes to our invitation. Thank you so much for having me. And for flying all the way from Abuja to Lagos. I am really chuffed that um, you. you took the trouble. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, because this is almost four years to the day since the abduction of the Depache girls and Leah Sheribu, who still remains in activity, I thought perhaps we should start our conversation mm -hmm. um, there because you've been a very vocal advocate of trying to get government to do the needful and rescue multiple children who've been abducted by the terrorist Boko Haram group. Let me start by asking you, after all the sort of work you did, how did you feel the day you found out that those Dabchi girls have been released, but Leah remains in activity? In, sorry, Leah remains in captivity. Mm -hmm. Well, it was quite uh, mixed uh, emotions. Uh, first of all, there was that happiness. You know, the girls have been released. Unlike what we had with the Chiba girls, still having a lot of them, uh, over a hundred still in captivity as, as of that time. So having them quickly being t uh, brought back home was, you know, uh, very uh, overwhelming. It was a happy moment, and we, it was joyous and, and all of that. But getting the uh, then there was also the the sadness and the tragedy of the father. About five of them were killed mm -hmm. in the process of getting uh, the girls back. And we heard of Leah Sheribu that was left uh, uh, in captivity. And so it's, it, it was also very depressing, you know. How can all everyone be brought back except for Leah Sharibu. And the reason that was given that she was not released, she was not amongst the ones that were brought back was because she refused to renounce her fate. And you're wondering, this is a fate... Uh, Islam says there's no compulsion in religion. You don't force anybody to become a Muslim. So why are you keeping a little girl for saying that she, she wants to practice her own faith when there's freedom of religion, even in, in Islam? So it's, it, it's really quite, uh, it was, it was a, a mis, it, it was mixed feeling and really sad. And it's so mm. sad that four years later, we, she's still not back home. She's mm. still with uh, the terrorists. And it seems as if the government has moved on from her issue. Mm. Now, the, the advocacy that you do, particularly around the release of, of these girls, obviously you've been advocating for a while. I understand from when you were... Um, in university and all that, but really the the advocacy that brought your name and mm -hmm. your voice to the national consciousness was the advocacy around the Chibok abductions, mm -hmm. the Bring Back Our Girls abductions. What is it like for you to be standing and advocating, um, you know, for the return of girls who've been taken by terrorists who say they are doing it in the name of your religion? Because you're very clear about your faith. You, you have no apology mm -hmm. about it. You've not, you know, been shy of projecting it and making it a source of your strength and talking about it. And then we have a group 
who claim to be Muslims like you who are doing these things. That must be difficult. Yeah, it, it's, it's quite difficult, um, most especially. I, 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 will, I will use um, one time when my daughter was speaking to me, and then there, there was, a, I think that was in 2014, there was a bomb blast in Pakistan, if I'm not mistaken. And she says, Mommy, why are they, why are they using Islam? Why can't, they, why can't they just come out and say, and own up to what they're doing, to the bad things they're doing. Why are they bringing Islam into this? Because this is clearly not not Islam. And it's really sad that Islam is a religion of peace, a religion that talks so much about whatever action you're taking, the effect that you, you have on another person, you should be mindful mindful of that. And then you have people who are coming out to kill, to maim, all in the name of religion. Uh, and, y you know, even in when it comes to war, there are certain engagements in, in Islam that are in rule of engagement. Uh, in, in wartime, and you, you don't touch women, you don't touch children, you don't touch unarmed people, you don't attack re, uh, religious uh, places, schools, you don't burn uh, food and on and on. There, there, there are rules of engagement. And then you just see these people who are coming out, terrorists, who are just killing, who are just maiming mindlessly, serial killers, and they're doing, they're hiding under the guise of re religion. It's really quite, um, it's, it's painful, especially where you have to be sort of like, you're always put on the line, you're always having to defend yourself and say that, oh, that's not what the religion uh, represents. But, but and that's, the that, this is a global you, thing now yeah, that is happening. Increasingly, um, you find, you know, in, in Syria, mm -hmm. uh, parts of Asia, um, and now increasingly parts of the Sahel, you know, um, um, East Africa, even Southern Africa, places like Mozambique, something called Islamic militancy, mm -hmm. or what has been described or is used by the media as, as Islamic militancy, is taking root. And increasingly, some of the atrocities we read about, we hear about, we see on our screens are committed by people who claim to be doing it in the name of a God and a religion that the two of us belong to. And, and to, to what extent does that sort of, are you conscious of that when you're doing your activism? And that, you know, perhaps in some ways you're also showing another face of Islam. Or is this not something that is in your sort of, foremost consciousness and you just do things driven by your conscience yeah I, I do things driven by my, my conscience I refuse to allow myself to be held back by certain people who are doing the wrong thing mm -hmm. just the way that uh, when people do certain things I refuse I don't see their religion or their gender or their tribe I focus on the wrongdoing and calling it out that's the way it is and it's, it's, it's sometimes quite difficult because at every moment you're being called upon as a Muslim I say oh that's your responsibility what somebody else has done mm -hmm. and you're being told that oh why haven't you said something why you you have to come out and, and you know denounce even when you're denouncing many people deliberately do not hear you they just want to see that you know in relation to 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 issue of uh, that, that uh, it's islam it's muslims that are doing it so you must but be does this not pause whether we like it or not a challenge um to to muslims who are sort of on the other end of the spectrum to um perhaps i mean whether we like it or not because they claim to be part of our community um do we not have a responsibility to sort of examine why Islam has found itself susceptible to attracting this sort of people who are sort of able to do certain atrocities in its name? In other words, do we need some sort of looking inwards and some house cleaning and, and talking to ourselves as the Muslim Ummah and the Muslim community? Or is it just that literally this is a global problem and yes, we are part of solving it, but it's also a solution that everybody needs to be looking to. So I, I think the way I, the way I look at it is the fact that religion, you know, over the years, over centuries, uh, people have used religion when it suits them. For example, when you have the uh, the. KKK movement and all of that. Religion was used to actually hang people. Religion mm. was used yeah, to actually drag. Uh, yeah, Christianity was used Continues to drag to be a pe right people issue. down. If you talk about the Lord's, uh, Lord's Resistance Army, which in is Uganda. in Uganda, which who practically did what uh, the the Boko Haram did, even to the extent of abducting, you know, uh, school children. It's all religion being used. So over the years, people have used religion. Has are uh, they hidden under the guise of religion to do all sorts of atrocities? But you know. When you talk about this, so for me as a woman, 
a black woman who is a, Mus- uh, a Muslim woman who right, wears the, the bottom hijab. of the global exactly. hierarchy. So right? you see, I'm used to <laughs> having if a black man does something somewhere, yeah. I, I as a black person, I have to pay for it. I'm yes. being told that, oh, those are your people. Mm. If a woman does something as a woman, you're being told. This. You know, so it's something that we, we've lived this so much. So for me, I deliberately refuse to allow that to hold me back or to, to not begin to or compensate for the fact that some people in, uh, that, that, that call themselves Muslims are not doing the things that uh, is Islam is, is, is all about. But at the same time, when you talk about our house cleaning, it's, it's also something that we need, need to look into and say, okay, why is it that at this present moment we have a lot of these issues within, uh, within uh, Islam and, and all of that? And for me, one of the things I've, I've realized over time is that you find that Islam always goes to, how do I put it? So let me give you, I, I'm from Agbede in, in Edo State, right? Mm-hmm. And in history, we are known as very fearsome people, very, you know, uh, uh, warlike people and hard. And even in Esako, in that part, it was, uh, but there was the first part that where Islam came to, where mm-hmm. our king, Obama Mamadou I, uh, came with uh, Islam itself. So you find that Islam goes to a lot of places where people are sort of like hardened. I don't know if that's the way I look at this theory. And then when they are exhibiting their customs, their behavior, we tend to think that, oh, it's that, that's the Islamic way. For example, the Arabs, they used to bury their daughters alive. Mm-hmm. That's not Islam. Islam sort of like stopped that. So when you see some pe- certain people behave in certain manner, so we you sort think of culture think sort of the, sometimes is, um, is conflated with Absolutely. with Islam, and, and people are accused of. And it. then there's that knowledge. Islam is about knowledge. If you don't have the knowledge, you really can't practice Islam. Let me just give you a, a, an example. Somebody will come out now and say that, oh, in Islam, or if they see someone who has dyed their hair, oh, you shouldn't dye your hair. But the thing is that no, you can dye your hair. The only thing is that you can't dye your hair black mm. because that will be mis representation but if i have pink or green my hair is not green before mm-hmm. so somebody saying it will know that that's not it. but somebody will come and just say oh no you don't do this because they haven't gone on to get that knowledge and we have a lot of people who are ignorant about the religion yes and and, and there are those that would even argue that truthfully there are also issues of interpretation on islam but outside the issues of religion itself um for many of us some of the attraction that we think these terrorists hold, um, we believe that would not have been possible if we've had good governance Mm -hmm. across Africa. So whether it is the problems in Mali, whether it is Burkina Faso, whether it is the poorer parts of Mozambique where you're seeing the rise of Islamic militancy, or even Northeast Nigeria and parts of Northwest Nigeria Mm -hmm. now where the problem is becoming uh, problematic. And this brings me to another aspect of your advocacy. Um, Your you know, determination to hold government accountable and to be very vocal in calling out, um, you know, uh, political office holders around the things that you think they're doing wrong. At what point did you decide that silence wasn't an option? Uh, Was it a deliberate decision or was it something that sort of happened gradually? Okay, so when it comes to national issue, it was on my 40th birthday that I decided, no, silence will no longer be an option. On my 40th birthday, I realized that I also was a problem of the country. Right. I grew up poor. I, I grew up, my father lost his business uh, around 83, 84, and then everything just went downhill to the extent that even feeding was a problem. And so for me, so I- So have that in common. Yeah, right? yeah, so you, you know how it is. If you're yeah. poor in Nigeria, you're faceless, nameless, and voiceless. Yeah. And you grew up not seen as a human being. You're yeah. just seen as a certain- You're like not seen, period. You're exactly that, just <laughs> you're not, you're not, you're not yeah. even seen literally at, at all. So the main focus for me was attaining financial independence. I needed to get that. I needed to get to a place whereby, you know, I know I can matter, my voice can matter. And so when I turned for it, I had already attained that. And I realized that I grew up hating Nigeria because uh, as, as someone who was in school, I was begging people to give me test book to read so I would get A's when I was writing my exam in 1991. And I never got those test books. So after the whole... So you hated Nigeria year, because Nigeria failed you failed in me. your head. Absolutely. You felt that as, as a teenager, not anything for you, right? You know, as a teenager. And I was, I was quite angry at my parents. And I would say to them, so that, why? you keep them quiet when the country is being run aground and there's so much corruption. And that's the thing that hurts me right now because it's actually my age mate who are now in the position of power who have continued this corruption so no that we're so angry about. No, yeah. no, we are the ones who are now given the problem. And so for me, that was, for me, it was that at that my 40th uh, birthday that I said I will no longer be silent on national issue. And I, I decided uh, I'm passionate about education, uh, you know, financial independence and, and women's rights. And I was like, okay, I'll start looking at things 
place that or along that line and start speaking on four months later Chibaga's abduction happened and I came out and I and I and that was for me that was the first time I came out on national issue but before then my first protest actually was 1992 my first day in, in the university and I can't even remember what we were protesting against but then <laughs> the school was closed down I remember when I was going my parents were like don't participate in any protest I said, yeah yeah I won't but when so, I got there so, I, so, so, I, I think it would be right to say that I think you know if we sort of look at your story and the story of other activists are born they're not made <laughs> Well, I, I don't mean, see like myself as an activist. I just say I'm an active Nigerian citizen. But then, of course, for me, I've always been vocal. I was very vocal. I've always been that way. And before I was 10 years old, I, I, I made a decision in my life that the worst thing any human being can do to me is to kill me. And that is not the worst thing because I'm going to die anyway. And I'm never, I'm never afraid. I, I don't fear people, but I respect people. And even as a child, you will beat me, and I will never, I will never drop a tear because I don't want to give you the satisfaction of seeing me break down. So I was that stubborn child, you know, that they normally call that stubborn child, but I've always been vocal a- anywhere. But on national issue, actually, it was my 40th birthday. Mm. So does it work in terms of getting the sort of results mm-hmm. that you want? Absolutely, it does. It does. Uh, speaking out on issues and, and making demands, it does work. Even though the, the government might be reluctant, they might make it, they might want to make it look as if, no, okay, your voice doesn't really matter. But at the end of the day, it does matter. There are a lot of advocacies that have put, uh, will be part or be vocal about. At the end of the day, we get the result. You might not get the result as much as quickly as you want it or the way you want it, but certainly something is done. And there's that fear when citizens speak out. Uh, the, the government sits up and it listens. But the biggest problem we've had have always been uh, other citizens who think that uh, citizens shouldn't speak up. So, yeah. so let me give, let me just give you a background. Mm. The first set of dictators we we came across with were actually parents in mm. this part of the world. We were told as children that we we, we shouldn't have voices, we can't speak. You can't ask questions. You, you can't ask questions. They will say you are a stubborn child, you are not well behaved, and all of that. And then we grew up into teenage. We went to school. Teachers did the same thing to us. They shut down our voices. Our really, we have religious uh, rulers also doing the same thing. And then when we become adults, we we just replace our parents with government, and we mm. expect that we shouldn't speak out. So those are the set of people that make it so difficult. They're ready to defend government at at the drop of heart, forgetting that citizens do have rights in that Going country. Going with that, you know, um, analysis that you just gave, um, is it your view, therefore, that there's a way in which our culture of sort of respect for elders and all of that has contributed to the lack of accountability um, that we see in government. Absolutely, absolutely. That's what has contributed. That agency, the way we were brought up, the way we were told that parents are always right, even when they are doing the wrong thing, that you can't question them. I, I So for me, I, it was something that I didn't like at all, and I made sure when I had my own children that I put them in a position where they would hold me accountable. I would say to them, look, Parents are not always right. Adults are not always right. You speak up, and if there's anything that uh, I've done wrong, it may come out. I grew up in this in an era where your parents will never apologize to you, even when they've done something wrong to you. And so, I made sure for me, I make sure that I, I my, my kids, wherever I've done wrong, I'll apologize to them, and they hold me accountable. And for me, the beauty of it, and I just wonder why other why parents don't see that. I love it when my children call me out because it means that you've brought up. You know, human beings who know the right thing and are, they are unafraid of speaking out. It, it's it's really been part of the problems that we have. And people think that this respect is about, you know, you kneel down for someone, you don't speak with it. That's not respect. That's mm-hmm. more or less like fear. Because you find that, that behind your back, these kids actually do a whole lot of things that they wouldn't do where you are. So where's the respect in that? So mm-hmm. for me, the respect is not just the kneeling down. It's not just the showing of it. It's actually when uh, you have someone that they've done something worthy of your respect and I always say to my children if the only reason that you respect me is because I gave back to you then I'm not deserving of that respect I should be deserving of I should do things that will make you respect me not because of the fact that I brought you to this world Mm. so I mean the advocacy work you've done over the years has earned you a lot of admirers I mean um, your picture during the NSAS protest has become iconic used globally to sort of um, um, focus on police brutality. Mm-hmm. I've even seen it in relation to sort of police issues that are not to do um, with Nigeria. And you sort of essentially catapulted into sort of, if you like, a global figure as a result of that. But you also have a lot of detractors, you mm-hmm. know, people who are not your fans, mm-hmm. who think you are too loud, you know, you are too personal in the way you 
you sort of deal with issues. So two questions. What is that like, being at the receiving end of that sort of vitriol, you know, because you're doing something that you feel is the right thing to do for this country? So for me, the first thing I say to myself, who am I that I shouldn't be hated? What's the big deal? For, they are to the same thing. So for me, uh, insults and praises are the same thing to me. They are people's opinion about me. They are not my reality. Mm -hmm. So if I don't get angry when people commend me and when people pray for me, why should I be angry when people insult me or they curse me or any of, of those or they attack me? So I don't, I don't take it pers uh, personal. I, I, I'm someone who I'm more focused on when I'm alone with myself and my thoughts. Do I like the person that I am? When I look into the mirror, am I proud of what I'm saying. That's more important to me than what uh, what is it that people are saying or what is it they are attacking you. I mean, for those people who are actually attacking me, you know, you know the funny part is that I'll be on the streets and they will see me and they will know me and I will look through them and I wouldn't know them. Mm. That's worse than that. Right. So, so then, yeah, I guess, you know, you, you, know, you, you me. know me. Yeah, I am I will somebody. Look at you. You I will nobody. know you. You will be the one to tell me, oh, this is who. And I've had some, some of them who come to me, oh, you know, we've, we, we, we we'll sometimes fight on you. I'm like, no, it's okay. It's your opinion. So if somebody comes and say, Aisha is a mad person, I'm not, I'm not mad. Mm. I'm, I, I don't get angry. The same way I don't get angry when somebody says, oh, Aisha, you're such an intelligent person. So it's just their opinion. So what I think for me, it's all about loving myself. And like I say, even on my, uh, on my Twitter handle, I say, look, I have enough love for myself. You, can, you will either love me or hate me, and either one is okay. And I know that I'm up your, up Opinionated. Okay, opinionated. Now, opinionated. Now, this is where the English comes in. For those of us that <laughs> had to, it reminds me of my secondary school where I went to. I couldn't speak English when I went to, when I changed secondary school for a while. They would make fun of me and there was no TV to watch. So we, mm. some of those words, they just get out. So, but I do know that I'm, I'm, I have a strong character and I'm, I'm somebody who, I will let my, my opinion be heard. I'm not going to, you, you won't shut me down. Even as a child, I refuse to be shut sure at talk less of now that I'm an adult. So, of course, there are some people that will be angry at that, and I totally look at that. It's, it's okay. It's normal. Mm -hmm. Bring it on, and, and we'll have that conversation. But for me, I'm, I'm never really bothered about it. And which part of, so what about the positive things that activism has brought? So the negativity is all the sort of negative mm -hmm, talk, mm -hmm. all the abuse, all the detraction talks saying all sorts of things what is the positive that has come out of you being vocal and not being scared to sort of call people out so i think the positive part will be when you meet this random people and they say to you we have you in our prayer points we are praying for you mm. and somebody will just say let me just give you a hug i mean for me for me those are the positive things you just and then you know when people will say to me oh you you speak our mind what we couldn't put into words you've spoken those things so i think for me those are the positive but then it also comes with something that i don't like i love my anonymity well yes yeah, sorry love <laughs> you've God. lost that yes that's, that's it and you know i'm this i'm this kind of person so because i wear the hijab yeah. so the first thing people see when you're wearing the hijab is that you're you're not intelligent you're not educated you can't even speak English. so they're biased it's yes, there's that bias. I've all, I'm always used to it. So I just sit down in my little corner. So sometimes when I'm even invited to speak at events, I just sit down in my little corner. People are looking. And then when you start speaking, like, okay, who is that? So I've lost that. And I miss that. Let's talk about the hijab. And, and I was going to sort of dive into politics and what we should do to get governance right. But I think I'll come back to it because you've raised mm -hmm. the issue of the hijab. Talking mm -hmm. about your hijabi, mm -hmm. for example, um, um people who wear it that I've spoken to, and I don't wear mm -hmm. it, but I sort of defend people's rights to either wear or not to wear. And um, people who wear it say similar things to what you say, that it's almost as if people have a mm -hmm. tick, tick box, mm -hmm. you know, about women who wear the hijab, or they are oppressed, or, you know, um, they've been brainwashed, or they, they, they can't be that smart if they are willing to sort of cover themselves mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, from the perspective of a Muslim woman sort of navigating a modern society um, where the other extreme is, of course, nudity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is sort of associated with being free, mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. being... What has that been like for you? And also, it, perhaps in even raising your daughter, mm -hmm. what are the conversations you've had with her around clothes and what they represent? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think I, I will start it with... Uh, going back to Bring Back Our Girls movement. So when, in 2014, when we started uh, the Bring Back Our Girls movement and, you know, you were all there, there was so much animosity. 
that people were feeling, members of the Bring Back Our Girls movement from other people, especially when they have the T-shirt or anything with the Bring Back Our Girls. My son even felt that in 2014, he had come back from uh, from his secondary school. He was on his way back to England. At the airport, he was actually harassed. Uh, that year. So he was wearing... Yeah, you know, he was wearing the Bring Back Our Girls uh, 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 movement uh, T-shirt. T-shirt. And so, so when did we talk about it? I was like, I wasn't feeling that. Until it dawned on me, the reason why I wasn't feeling that was because that's the way I've been treated because I wear the hijab. Ah. So that, so it took me so opposite. That animosity. Yeah, I wasn't feeling it because I was already used to it. I, I get it wearing the hijab. So there are people who come, even the way they would talk to you, even the way they would react to you, certain things they would they would tell you not to do things. I remember when I wanted to go for like visa, I'm being told, oh, remove your hijab. If you don't, with your hijab, certain countries are going to deny you visa. I'm like, okay, fine. If they deny me visa, I'm only going there to spend uh, for holidays. If they don't, I find another place to go to. So all of that, you know, quite that, that, that. that there was already one. a sort of resilience yes. to that. Uh, yeah, so I'm used, I was, I was used to it. So it took me a while before I realized, okay, this was a re- this was the reason and especially with the the whole uh, terrorists happening and you know the islamic militancy there's more animosity uh, you know, towards people just just wearing the hijab and it's it's how do i put it it's it's always so the bias is unbelievable sometimes you're treated as if you're dead you get mm. into places and you're actually treated as if you're nothing, as if you're you're dead. And the, the way it it goes on, I I remember my daughter as a teenager. One, one time she was like, "Oh, uh, mommy, there's so much Islam Islamophobia. Uh, how do I? I don't, I don't think I want to even go to school, you know, oh. abroad and all of that." We had we had to sit down and have that conversation and just knowing that this is who you are. For the thing for me, the things I've tried to do with my kids is to always uh, give that room of uh, acceptance. Accept people for who they are. It doesn't matter. People have a right to do what they want to do. And like I always say to people, the right I have to wear the hijab is the right another person has to wear mini skirt or not wear anything at all. It's mm. their right. And we must respect that. And I say to people, our religious injunction is not mandatory on uh, uh, another person or whoever wants to do it or don't want to do it. It's a personal uh, relationship with God. And, and that's the way it, it goes. Uh, so in, in terms of my daughter, like she, she, she grew up wearing the hijab, I think from the age of like, was it uh, seven age? She will, she will cover, she will go on. But right now she uses the small veil. Mm-hmm. She doesn't wear the whole Full. like I like I do. It's mm-hmm. her choice. She, she's the one that will make that, that choice for herself. And she has done that. That's what she does. Even when she was in, in a particular school uh, in UK, when she went for her sixth form, she was the only person who was wearing hijab in her school. She was comfortable in it. And of course, the school also it was provided enabling environment for her to be able to thrive on it. But coming back to the hijab, I started wearing hijab in 1992. Mm-hmm. I think I was how old was I then? Because of I mean it's December born, so it's always difficult. So we know? share this. Yeah, so it's always I, I think yeah. I was seventeen, going mm-hmm. on eighteen. I'll be so that was when I came back and I was wearing the hijab, and there was so much. Uh, how do I put it? It wasn't wearing hijab wasn't common. The first time I saw somebody wearing hijab was actually nineteen ninety one, mm-hmm. and it was my IRK teacher, and we called her Ninja. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, what's this? Why are you covering up? Because they mostly will, used to wear black. Yes, in black, those days. and Who then we just wearing? have the the eyes. So the like, makeup, the full yes, makeup, the, and they were like Ninja. So when I came back, my parents weren't happy. Like, what's the meaning of this? Why did they think you'd be radicalized? I don't. I don't was even know. Fear? I think there was this thing about oh, you're not behaving like um, a what? teenager. No, no, no. What's this? What was this other set we have in? Izala. So like, oh. oh, are you not doing, are you not behaving like Izala? Are you not doing this? So it was, it, they were, no, nobody were happy, even within my own family. Because it wasn't something that was, it was, okay, you're not married. Why are you covering up yourself? Who is going to marry you? And stuff like that. But it was what I wanted to do. And if I make up my mind about something, I know I'm that stubborn. Okay, and I mean, earlier you would made references to your Edo identity. And I think that's another thing that people um, sort of um, find problematic with you. Mm-hmm. Um, they can't put you in a box, yes. right? So I know that when you first started becoming visible, um, at least on the national stage, the initial assumption was that you are a either Hausa Fulani mm-hmm, girl, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, from Northern Nigeria. Yeah. And the fact that you speak Hausa fluently, yes. I think added to that. And until you started actually talking about your cultural heritage, not many people knew mm-hmm. you were from Edo. So. How has that also influenced you? Um, yes, coming from a different culture, but really being at home, you know, with another culture fully because you, you were born, bred mm-hmm, in Kano. Mm-hmm. And I dare say if Nigeria was a different place, we wouldn't be talking about your Edo yes, culture. Yes, absolutely. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yes, you, absolutely. It wouldn't because yeah. uh, you were formed. 
in Kano. In Kano. Born and brought right. up in Kano. <laughs> yes. Primary secondary university yes. in Kano. But navigating that that those issues of identity in a place where we've turned this into something mm-hmm. significant. Mm-hmm. What's that been like for you? So Edo, Kano, Hausa, Muslim, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Et so, so, so for me, it's um, let let me just first of all let me even go back to Hausa. I say hi, how can you? German can you? Hausa can you? Can So I speak like a native. I grew up in maybe the, I should in the ghetto. translate that for those who don't understand. <laughs> Born and bred in Born Kano. Born and bred in Kano. And then speaking speak Hausa, Hausa like uh, oh, better than a donkey of Kano. Kano. <laughs> donkey from Kano. That's what she said. Yeah, that's the literal meaning. Yeah. So that's the way they, they put it. So for me, it's always been, and especially when they, I see when I meet people and I'm talking and they are like like oh. I, I'm from Edo City. They're like, oh, no wonder. I'm like, why are you saying no wonder? I was born and brought up in Kanu. So everything, I grew up there. I went to school there mm. and, and all of that. But the thing that it has done for me is that it hasn't made... I'm not biased about any part. Like I say, I'm a Nigerian. Mm. I have no loyalty to the North. I have no loyalty to the South. And I can look the North and say, this is what is wrong here. This is the beauty of... These are the things that are beautiful about the North. These are the things that are wrong at the North. Also, likewise, South, and say, these are the things that are beautiful about the South. And also, these are the things that are ugly, that are not beautiful about the South. Whether it's Islam or Christianity, whatever it is. So I just start at that balance where I'm really not... Uh, like I say to people, uh, I'm, I'm not on anyone's side. I'm not even on my own side. Mm. As much as possible, I pray always to be on the side of the truth. So it, it's sort of like there's a freedom that I have from not having to... To, to fit into, into any f- box. Into any box. And mm. that's one of the reasons why I always talk about the father. I don't do label. Mm. Labeling, I don't do it because what what normally happens is that they put they label you and then they fit, put in a bus and you're supposed to act the way they want to see you. I say no, 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 no. I shall oh, as an activist, I say I'm not an activist. <laughs> I'll come out to speak. I don't have. To. I would rather be sleeping and having fun than that if everything was was okay. So I think for me, it gives me a certain level of freedom and I'm able to 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 say anything that I need to talk about. And that's why surprisingly, you find that that you find a. On one hand, you see people that say, oh, Aisha hates Northerners. Another hand, you see people that say, Aisha hates Southerners, or Aisha hates Igbos, Hausa, Yoruba, Aisha hates When every side thinks you yes, hate them, Aisha I think hates you're probably Christ- doing something right. Oh, the, the same thing. The one that I say always, they tell you, on one hand, oh, Aisha is a gay rights activist. Oh, Aisha is homophobic. I'm what glad is- you cleared this No, yes, I'm it's like, like, out there. <laughs> that, there's nothing I've not heard, you know. There was one that said to me, oh, why is it that you're not, this thing they've said about you, why are you not out there trying to say, uh, uh, to, I am not I'm like, I don't have that time. What's my business? People will think whatever they want to think. Please feel free. And, you know, I was having that discussion with my husband, and he said to me, you know what? Some of these things they deliberately say so that you'll be focused on trying to let people know that you're not what they're saying you are, so that you not have the time to do what it is you you're fo- fo- focused focus on. Let's talk about him. Yes. Eh? Let's talk about him, because you, you <laughs> always talk about yeah, him. Yeah, I do. And then you um, always say, why are you always talking about him? <laughs> You always talk about him, and um, given some of the stereotypical um, things people believe about mm. Muslim men, for example. Oh, by the way, do you know another thing? Yeah. They actually say that my husband is not a Muslim. Oh, really? Yeah, we've seen that. Oh, I haven't heard even that. Even there's even a man that did the whole, they did a whole production on me from an Islamic channel to talk about, they, they say he's not a Muslim. I'm like, oh, okay. Since you are not you people are not the ones that are giving Islam. Food. Well, so this was what I was about to actually say. Like, um, yeah, so stereotypes about mm-hmm. you know Muslim men and what they allow and not allow their wives to do. Talk me through um, your relationship and how you've managed to form what appears to be a real partnership mm-hmm. where he supports you, you support mm-hmm. him, mm-hmm. and you guys are not allowing the noise, if mm-hmm. you like, to sort of um, disrupt. Mm-hmm the sort of life that you guys have decided that's what you're trying to build for yourselves and for your kids. Okay, so where do I start from? So I met my husband December 13th, 1996. I'm born on December 13th. Oh, you know my that, goodness. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was my, a day after my 23rd birthday. Okay. So he was, I call him my 23rd birthday present. So I saw him on that day. It was my uncle's bachelor's eve. That was my first party night. But my, my uncle needed me to be able, you know, when they donate money, to be able to gather the money, money for him. I wanted to go to a friend's wedding. And so I was forced to be at my uncle's wedding. And I saw this man who just stood up. I was the usher there. And I fell in love. Mm. Absolutely. First, uh, first, first, first time fell in love. But he didn't fall in love with me anyway. He was in another relationship. So he didn't have my time. He didn't really see me. <laughs> so I went there. And then, of course, I... Uh, 
you know, then you after wedding, there's this case that they pass at a video mm-hmm. case that different people will be watching. Yeah, that's how yeah. we did it then. So I, I opted for my uncle to take it to his office. So that's how I started going there. So I practically toasted my husband. <laughs> and I didn't make fun of him up to today. And so, so we started that. Re- it was eight months later that my husband uh, would come and then uh, we started the relationship. And uh, right from the beginning, it was different. And uh, when he when he wanted to come, the day because on the, in the moment I was taking those video cassettes to him, I would go to collect it. He asked me why are you still at home, and I was like, oh, school hadn't opened then I hadn't gotten a com- oh, no school had opened I hadn't gotten accommodation. And so my husband said, okay, then he wasn't my husband. He now said that if any time I'm going there, that I can ask him to come and take me there. So when I told my uncle that his friend was my uncle was quite surprised. Me, where did you? I like. Ah. I've already made my moves. So he took me there that day and he said to me... He became your driver. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so he took me to... And he said something. He said, maybe I will come on Saturday. And I looked at him and I said, I don't do maybes. It's either you're coming mm. or you're not coming because I can't stay in my room all day waiting for, waiting you. for you. So I've been always been a forthright uh, kind of person. And so we started our relationship from there. And he was the first person who actually said to me that I needed to be financially independent for me to have my own voice, mm. that as women, if you don't have anything, so you will be able to, if you're able to control your wealth, you have your own money, you have to, what you're doing, you won't be so much in other people's sort of like uh, control. And he's a feminist to the core. He mm. believes in women's rights. You, oh, it's unbelievable. And so we started from there. He's actually 12 years older than me, mm. but he has never pulled any age, you know, kind of. Old, do you, do you think that helps? Mm, I think gap, so. Maybe he's sort of does. Older and mature. Yeah, and so because sometimes he just look at me and say, "You, this is your mouth, eh? <laughs> you know, this is your mouth." And someone like, "Oh, Ali go ongwe," meaning it's it's small child. That it's what language you, is that? That's Esako. Okay. I speak Esako too fluently. Too. Okay. Yeah. So 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 it's been. He is he from Esako? Yeah, he is. Well. He's, okay. he's from Awuchi. Oh, he's from Awuchi. Yeah, he, okay. he's from Awuchi. I'm from Agbede, okay. just a few uh, kilometers apart. But the thing that we have, so we built our relationship on what we wanted. We didn't even do the traditional things. For example, I find it surprising. You know, there's this when you're going to wear the woman, you carry things like when you buy the box. Mm. You know, it was, Kai Lefe. Kai Lefe. it was myself and my husband that took our Kai Lefe there. <laughs> we bought it together. We didn't bring family. So right from day one, we were like sort of like different. Even in terms of... You just decided that, what was going to work for you and that you was stuck it. to yeah, it. Yeah, we stuck to it. Without sort of looking at convention. No, 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 no. We didn't, we didn't do convention at, at all. Mm. We didn't do... Because if we had done convention, honestly, it wouldn't have worked. I, I'm very lazy. When he proposed, I told him straight up, I'm very lazy. I don't like to work. I don't like housework. And I'm, I, I was always, always very sick. Well, like, but when you say lazy what you mean is you don't like housework but I you are hard working in other things that's areas, what a lot of right? people say that you know so, like right now i can't remember when last i entered the kitchen yeah, or cooked or swept or dried any of those yeah, things yeah, nah yeah. so right from the one you knew that i needed that help and i think one of the things that has really worked for us is the fact that we are a couple very close knitted couple every, even our kids sometimes feel left or uh, left out mm. we, we're very close and then we also maintain our individuality so mm-hmm. the fact that we're married, we didn't just like get into each other. No, he does his own thing in his own with his friends. I do. So he's complete my, in his own. Yes, way. I'm You're complete. Yes, and, and then we come, come together, together again. We are this, you know. So that's I think for me, out, yeah, that's what works. For example, on my uh, last, not last year, last year's 2020, na- 2019, uh, that was my 47th birthday, and I decided I was going to, I wasn't going to stay in the house. I said I was going to check into the Hiltons and have weekend it was a weekend the birthday was saturday so from friday and i invited my he was like oh no you know i don't like staying and sleeping because he can't sleep very well when he's not at home i like okay guy no wala bye bye i called a friend of mine and i left him at home and we checked into the hilton and so my friend she came we had fun went spa all of those things so that's the way it is other people like oh how do you leave him you left him outside yes now he couldn't come, so I need it. And then that's just the way we do our own thing. And I think it's really been amazing. Like, for example... And so the advice to young girls that are now... There are quite a lot of them now that look up to mm-hmm, you, especially mm-hmm. since the um, NSAS protests. Um, and I know a few because I had an earful mm-hmm. in this office, <laughs> you know, about bringing you over. So they're listening to you. They're beginning at the beginning of their lives. They're navigating mm-hmm, all these mm-hmm. things. And it's not an easy world. Yeah. You know, it's a difficult world. You're dealing with poverty. You're dealing with government issues. You're dealing with police brutality. And then you're dealing with um, cultural issues, mm-hmm. men who see feminism as a bad word. What's your advice for them as they sort of navigate relationships? The first thing I have for them is they should find themselves. 
Nobody owes you happiness. No, you're not going to fight happiness with somebody else. Know who you are. First of all, find yourself. Know who you are. Accept yourself for who you are. And don't be ready to compromise on your on who you things that are very dear and personal to you. There are certain things you can't compromise on. Then the next thing is to find someone that you 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 meet on a level of values. You, sh you have shared values with because that's one of the things that people don't really focus on shared values are very important and so if those values are not there there's no there's no difficulty you can walk away it's okay mm -hmm. it's okay to walk away it's okay to be single being single like I, I was having a conversation like I don't care with my mom and I was saying to her look this issue of putting marriage as if marriage is some sort of like trophy if you're not married then you haven't achieved certain it we need to do away we need to do away with it that's not the way it should be that's what's forcing a lot of people no matter even when they see someone who is not the Who's kind of person. And they yes, they just the want to go in just, just so that they will say, so first of all, find yourself. And then you find somebody who you share these values with. And then the next most important thing is that it should be about strength-based roles, not gender-based roles. In my, in my with myself, I'm a relationship with myself and my husband. That's what we've always done. Like when we had the our children. things you do well. That's yes, what that's mean. what I, yes. what they say women, women should, should do. Because I wasn't born with a frying pan. <laughs> I didn't come to this world with a pot in my hand or a spoon. I came I came everybody and the man too didn't come with a checkbook so let's be coming down mm. you know let's be coming down small small and so for me like when we had when we started having children there was a bit of issue because i'm like i said i'm lazy I don't wake up in the morning. I'm not a morning person. I probably will be sleeping by 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. So what we do, like with our son, when he started school, my husband will wake up. He really want to bathe him, take care of him, do all of that, take him to school. Then by 11, that's when I wake up. I'll be the one to pick him and bring him back. So you see, it works for all that strength base. If he was the kind of person that would like, oh, you must wake up and you must take care of this child. You must do breakfast for me. You must do that for me. I probably wouldn't be married now. Mm. I would not like to. Mm. I always tell to people the reason why I have an amazing relationship she has also to do with my husband you know understanding this is who she is and being willing to help and being willing to to do a, lo a lot of things so for mm -hmm. me i say to those uh, to the girls is that just find yourself don't be in a hurry don't just be in the hurry know who you are accept yourself for who you are and then there are certain things that you know these are the minimum standard don't lower them because of somebody if you're low lowering anything for anybody then that person is not what uh, who you should be with because if you don't get the right partner they can actually truncate your destiny and turn you 360. Where you should be facing right, you will not be facing left. It's, I it's, like how you put it. Instead of facing forward, you not, your life will not be going the opposite <laughs> yeah. side. So be very careful and just, just take your time. It will be when it will be, whether early or late. Or late. National elections, 2023. Mm. And you can hear already the jostling has started the, I th call it negative campaigning. Mm. It's like, you know, um, you can already tell that it's going to be a very fractious election, which from where people like me sit, doesn't look like it may make much of a difference to the life of Nigerians. Because the way the political parties choose who we end up with on the ballot papers is not that democratic, is not that representative. And so many of us believe that by the time you get to the polls, often it's too late mm -hmm. in terms of just choosing the right person. Given that we're now preparing for polls and some of the sort of big issues, some would say existential issues that are facing this country, whether it is the terrorism in the Northwest, um, the war that has now entered, I think maybe it's 11th year, the Boko Haram war in the North east whether it is some of the sort of poverty we see across um the south south where mm. people's means of livelihood have been destroyed you can't drink water you can't fish pollution in places like port harcourt cultism mm -hmm. you know killings ritual killings gang wars i mean it looks like across nigeria we're facing some major issues what are your thoughts regarding um, the political process and what we are seeing going on with the political parties, given the major issues facing this country? So the first thing, my thoughts, is the fact that um, Nigerians need to wake up and understand that nation building, there's no shortcut to nation building. Also, we cannot pray our way 
to prosperity to, 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 to a good nation yeah. it's not going to happen god is not going to come down and fix nigeria for us god will not do for us what he has given us the capacity for us to do for ourselves and so we need to get to work when you talk about the issue of the political parties and the fact that the kind of candidates that they give us, which who, which, who are the candidates that we are forced to uh, vote for at the end of the day, and like you rightly said, what we have on election days, mostly in Nigeria, it's not even an it's not election; it's actually uh, endorsement, or uh, it's just a. Uh, uh, it's there's a word I think I I just went off. It's just an endorsement of what they already uh, put put out there. We need to give them an incentive. We need to give the political parties incentive for them to bring forth the candidates who have competence, character, and capacity. Because How do every, we do that? Every, yeah, I, I'm going to go to the Every of these political parties, they actually have people who have the competence, character, and capacity. But the thing is that there's no incentive to give them the party tickets because they know at the end of the day, we've given up of our power. When we say things like, oh, it's only party A or B that will win. So what you're trying to tell them is that whoever they want, like, they can put it out there, they will be the ones to win. And if any if they, any one of them lose, they will just simply migrate from one party to the other. Mm -hmm. and, and I hold, mean, you hear people saying for, if you vote, if, you, if your vote is not for APC or PDP, you are wasting your Exactly. Vote. So, and then how do you expect them with that kind of mentality for them to actually give you a candidate? So what we need to do now is first of all, we need to, to have work being done, right? The first thing we need to do is that we, the people, begin need to start a people's uh, convention within our communities, within where we are. Who are the candidates that we know are the ones that will go there and offer us the kind of governance that we are looking for, good governance? We need to begin to put them forth and say to these parties, if you do not give these people these tickets, wherever they go to, we're going to vote for them. Mm. Is the people, what we must do now, Nigerians must vote candidates instead of party. The moment we begin to do that, then the candid the parties will not have the incentive for us to for them to give us uh, 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 candidates with competence, character, and capacity. But most imp but most importantly, we tend to focus too much on the executive arm of government. People are interested who becomes president. National. People are interested who is the governor. No. Why don't we focus on the legislative arm of government? The legislative arm of government is actually the bedrock of democracy. If you have the legislators, they they, they make uh they will make laws. They will hold the executive accountable. They have oversight function. And so when, if we're able to get the right kind of people into the state houses of assembly, into the House of Representatives, into the, the Senate, and then these are people who we know we, we work on giving us good governance, they will help us to hold the executive accountable. The executive will not do some of the things that they do today if they know that there's a uh, 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 legislative arm that will checkmate them, that will even impeach. Or and do there, I mean, there are those who argue, for example, that those are even easier elections to absolutely to influence, to influence. and i was are, coming to that they are actually within what they call um constituencies yes and so it's a smaller group it's it's, it's a smaller and then, regionally it's more, everything about it do you know that there are people more. in the national assembly with less than ten thousand votes wow yes and over time for example in the next few months there are going to be some by elections this by elections happen. You can we can pick them up. Look for credible candidates. Populate the legislative um, so that when they have the some Nigerians we are, we are asking for we want a new constitution. We owe oh, the nineteen ninety nine constitution. Uh, it's it's not the right one. It's not a good one. Is this is that? Why are we not putting the right people in the legislative arm of government to go and do that? If the president doesn't uh, sign, doesn't uh, then they can veto the president and just pass the law. They have this power. Now and I we know can that get you've tried to structure there. your advocacy, especially around elections. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the work that you're doing. Also, the, the work that we're doing right now, there's, there's an, um, uh, uh, an organization we just came together, Active Nigerians, just coming together to form, which is Four Citizens Alliance. Basically, what we're saying is that let's have a platform. See, the thing is that politics is not a love affair. We don't, we don't need our emotions in politics. And I think that's what the citizens have been doing. They, they, they attack each other they, because of political choices and all of that. Some of them have been enemies for years. Meanwhile, the politicians are not enemies for years. They, mm. they, when it fits them, they work. So let's come together. Maintain, you may, we maintain our individual identity, our organizational identity. But we work on a platform where we are coming together, on each, where we have our shared goals. We work on that together. For example, the main thing now is uh, registration of, uh, uh, for, for PV. 
VC. Let people go and get their permanent vote, uh, voters card. Some people are saying that, oh, if we get it, what's the essence of getting it? Who are you going to vote for? You don't look for money when you already have something to buy. You mm. look for money, then you go and look for what mm. to buy with, with the money. So it's the same thing. Our currency is actually our PVC. And we're saying to Nigerians, get your PVC. Don't just get your PVC. Influence other people. Get five other people to get their PVCs, and those five we continue. Let's ha let's use the power of five. Let's get it's sort of like network marketing. Let people people get those PVC. Then we'll do a people's convention. Let's be able to say, for example, in your community, who do you want to see as your house of uh, assembly member, state house of assembly member? Who do you want to see as your house of rep member? Let's have a people's uh, pa pa parliament, and then that gives the politicians incentive for to vote. And, and then at you the say end to of the, the day, parties, these are the people we that want. we want. If you don't don't give them, we'll follow them to where they are. The reason why we have what we have today is because people are voting parties instead of voting candidates. And then you see, when they come in, for example, at the National Assembly, most of us say that, oh, the members of the National Assembly, they really, they are not working for Nigeria. And I said to Nigeria, why would they work for you? Mm. You didn't vote for them. You only endorse their selection. Mm. They, their loyalty is to those party big wigs that who gave them, them the party tickets. tickets. So until we, the people, are the ones who are determining the election, they are not going to be loyal to us. And a lot of people we have our circle of influence, but we don't use it. Mm. I mean, I'm sure now if you open your phone, there are people calling you and texting you and asking for money. Mm -hmm. There are people asking for all sorts of things. We are playing the roles of role of government in people's lives, but yet we do not talk to them about politics. Then the politician will come every four, once in every four years. They will give them 500 naira, and then they will ask for their vote. It's quid pro quo. It's something of importance for something of importance. If we are not having that conversation with the people around us to say to them, who are you voting for? How are you voting? This is the importance of all because a lot of people People do not understand the relationship between uh, governance and their lives. So there's a woman who has spent all her years selling ice fish, sent her child to school. The child is a graduate, but there's no job. Guess who she's blaming? She's blaming village people. She's blaming enemy. She's blaming witches. She's blaming principalities <laughs> and powers. Meanwhile, <laughs> government has not given uh, economy, enabling economy for businesses to thrive, for her child to be employed. And you know the greatest problem we have? Mm. Religious leaders. Mm -hmm. Those people, we need to do something about them. Tell because me. they have enslaved the masses. The religious rulers and the political rulers are working hand in hand. They have a symbiotic re a relationship. The religious rulers need the political uh, rulers to give bad governance so that they can sell to us cheap, cheap miracles. Mm. Oh, you get a job, they say it's a miracle. Somebody will carry their NYC certificate to go and meet Pastor Malem, Dibia, Boka, Babala, or to bless. For what? What are you blessed? Is that the kind of miracles we are looking for? And then when they get you, you now come and start doing a testimony. So, and then the political uh, rulers, they need the religious rulers to keep the masses suppressed. So they tell you that, oh, you know, you're supposed, even if you don't, you, you, you suffer in this world, it doesn't matter because so, in the air after mm, you're going to enjoy and things like that. Are you hopeful that these elections of February 2023, the national elections, and I'm talking uh, federal, I'm talking state, mm -hmm. I'm talking um everything really that's going to happen in, in between sort of February um, down. Are you hopeful that we're going to see a significant change? I am. If Nigerians decide to, to, to put in the work, every one of us, right. decide to put in the work. So we will, 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 will you done. put in the work? I mean, I'm, I know you're working already, but are you going to contest, Abs for example? No, no, I'm not going to contest. I'm okay. not, uh, for me, my, 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 my main work for the next 10 years, and I've said a lot of people have said, oh, do you want to go? I said, no, I don't have the competence to contest for something because I don't want to go in there and just be hearing siren being blown for me. No, if I'm not going to make a difference a hundred years from today, they're going to talk about Aisha Yusuf who was once in, in, in a political position and she did something good. Then there's no need for contesting. My main focus now is for us to get as many people as we can, com people with competence, character and capacity into the legislative arm of government. Let's secure that, first, uh, that place first. So on the issue of uh, whether uh, the 2023, yes, as long as we realize that every one of us, we must work. A lot of people will say to oh, democracy has failed in Nigeria. Not they ask them whether they have PVC, and they don't. Well, how will democracy uh, well, not fail you when you don't even have your PVC? Mm. You are not even participating. And people with what you know, the biggest lie that has been sold in Nigeria mm. is that votes don't count. If votes don't count, why are politicians buy, uh, selling, uh, buying votes? The only reason why they tell uh, tell us votes don't count is so that the people whose votes cannot be bought are kept away from the polling mm. unit, so that those ones whose votes can be bought come in and they buy. It. And when for 
although so, some register and they do not even come out to vote, and what happens is that those unused ballot papers are actually tumpreted by the politi- uh, by the parties mm. and the politicians, and so those uh, uh, ballot papers are also being used. So we are going to get a nation that is amazing if we put in so the work. So you really are hopeful Absolutely. about Nigeria. You're not if, one of those that have given no, up. No, you no, look no. at the hey, Boko sister, Haram. We die here. You look at Boko Haram. You look at cultists. You look at all the issues that if we're going. If they through. are not getting tired, we are not going to get tired. We die here. And I we die here. We die here. Not be smart. <laughs> what is the way we all speak English here? Me, I drop the English for one side. You see this country where we get now, all of us get uh, their papa, they oppress our own papa. Then they, they go come oppress or come oppress our children. children. How do I want to happen now? I say to people, no, this country we can work for. If the people who are giving bad go- governors are not getting tired, how dare we say we are going to get tired? What did we do? I mean, I mean, wait, so I look that continue. Hey, without continue, we start. We dare here. No, mm. no, no, no retreat, no surrender. We are not. We know they go leave. This is our country, hundred percent Niger, and we must make sure that this country works. And I say to a lot of people, do you know? Sometimes I'm so angry that before I was born into this country, that people didn't deem me see me as important enough for them to fight for Nigeria mm. for me. Mm. And I will do that to the next generation. I will fight. I'm fighting for the unborn generation the way I wish others had fought for me so that we'll get a country that is amazing. And Nigeria has the potential. All we need to do, let's remove the fear. Re- let's remove the religion. Let's remove the ethnicity. A lot of us, people say that Nigerians are not united. I say to them, our corruption unites us. Yes, no. The bad governance to trade, um, the lack people of don't bring. Trade. They don't, but you see, they do business among ourselves. Absolutely, we trade among ourselves. Um, when contractors are doing yep. sharing contracts, they don't FEC. remember. <laughs> but know? it's when we come to. Rock. But you see what I even say. We, if you go to any part of Nigeria, there's bad governance, there's corruption, there's en- unemployment, there's lack of access to good quality education. In fact, and edu- there's, there's no good health care. Education is ni- in Nigeria is dependent on the economic sta- uh, status of one's family. And that's a cr- that should be that's the greatest of all injustice. Because education is supposed to be a leveler where the child of the poor can become somebody without knowing anybody with that education. So all of these problems that we have, can we unite on this problem so that when these problems are faced, I'll come and look at you and say, see, see, I say you, you are from Zafara, I have to be for a do. (laughs) But right now, we don't have that luxury because we have problems Problems. and we need to fix the problems. Can we use those problems, unite on them, get them done so that we have a country that we all can be proud of? I I, I mean, the other day I saw that uh, how many people applied for uh, Nigerian citizenship. I I don't even think it was up to a thousand. I was like, is it only these few people that apply? We need to see people in their hundreds of thousands fighting over like before, yes, when they used to, to be, fight to, to come to, to, to Nigeria. Be, to, 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 to be Nigerians. And we can get that country. All we need is work. And that's what a lot of people are, are afraid of. They would rather go and stay in their religious houses and be praying. Or more pray, I know they work for this one. All of us, we need to work. Mm-hmm. We need to put in the work and get the nation that we want. Aisha Yusuf, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking Thank to you. Thank you. And that's it for this edition of the program. Join us again next month when I'll be speaking to another accomplished Nigerian. I am Gadria Ahmed.